People are slowly trickling in. Pretty cool to have people waiting. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, kia ora, welcome everyone um, to this virtual space. We are joined again with Christy and she is joined with Tyler and Ren um, from the Heart Movement. So before we get into formal introductions and karakia, um, we'll just do a very brief virtual housekeeping as people are slowly tricking in and I'll repeat it again at the end. So this is Zoom and some of you are very familiar with this space and we've been here before and I can see lots of familiar names in the space. And to be able to engage in today is really a panel-led discussion. So we're gonna do a brief, um, in, there's gonna be a brief PowerPoint to begin with, and then we're really counting on all of you sending lots and lots of questions through. Um, but to engage with us, there's those icons down the bottom, which is the chat function where you can talk to us um, and the Q&A. But we'll get started formally as most of you have joined in now. So we'll start with a karakia. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, kia mā kina kina ki uta, kia mā tara tara ki tai, e hi ake ana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hau hu, ti hei mauri ora. So, I will, um, was there anything else I needed to run through before I hand formally over to you fabulous people? Have I missed anything out? So just to introduce myself, because I often find um, when I re-look at my videos is, oh, I haven't actually said who I am. So kia ora, I'm Miriam from Toi Caucus um, at Te Oakeahina National Network Ending Sexual, Ending Sexual Violence Together. And it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you, all of you attendees. Um, I acknowledge all of the Indigenous lands where you are joining us from and the Indigenous lands that I'm broadcasting from. Um, and then we have three fabulous presenters today. So jump in on the chat and let us know where you're from and who you are. In particular, we would really um, love it if you can, when you put your, your um, when you use the chat function, by default at the moment, Zoom for some unknown reason, puts that you can just message us. But if you put that, that, that tag down, it will give you the option to um, chat with all attendees and panelists. Select that one so everyone can learn who you are and where you're from. And I will hand over to you all to introduce yourselves, introduce today's session, and I'll be in the background helping out. Kia kite. Kia ora, Miriam. Um, kia ora koutou, ko Christy Trawasa toku ingoa. Um, for those of you who joined last time, you will have met me already. Originally from Auckland, now live in Whangarei, and I'm a family violence prevention specialist, um, really focused on community-based approaches and prevention. Um, pass you on to Tara and Ren. Kia ora koutou. my name is Tara. I am a um, change agent of the Heart Movement. Um, I'm also a mother and I um, am a director of Dako Totoko, which is a social enterprise and a service and system designer for Tamaki Regeneration, so very busy. Kia ora everybody, my name is Ren. I'm the lead for the Heart Movement. Um, but by no means the expert, <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy that we um, have Christy and Tara here to talk um, about the heart movement as well. And if we look similar, it's because we are actually sisters. <laughs> so just getting that out there. <laughs> kia ora, kia ora. So the first um, part of the session today is going to be um, presenting a bit more about how you would develop your own community mobilisation initiative. And the second part will be a panel. So we three can answer your questions. Today has come directly from the first session that we did two weeks ago, which was an introduction to community mobilisation. And people said the first thing that they wanted to learn more about was how to develop their own initiatives in their own communities. So that's what this is about. And as Miriam said, please send through your questions as they go. She is a ninja of um, managing the chat and we'll get the questions through to the, the second part of the session. So um, if you haven't seen the first um, webinar, please have a look at that afterwards. It will fill in a lot of gaps for um, this one because it builds on that last session. Um, so, uh -huh. Um, in today's session, we're going to talk about how to develop a community mobilisation initiative using the example of the heart movement in Tāmaki. There are three key tools that we use to help develop heart. Um, they are the Tāmaki Inclusive Engagement Strategy, Community Readiness Assessment and Theory of Change. So I'll talk to you about those and send links so that you can go in deeper if you're interested. We'll talk about um, 
what we've learned so far and then our next steps for um, planning for heart because it's an iterative strategy. So we're always building and developing. Uh, just a quick reminder, what is community mobilisation? Uh, it's a transformative approach used to create social change on complex issues. This is not for the simple problems. This is for the gnarly problems like family and sexual violence, right? Um, it's a long-term approach. It's multifaceted. There are many facets to it because we're working in communities and with the complexity of communities. It uses a capacity building approach and aims to engage large numbers of community members in local action for change. Um, so here are kind of some key steps for developing a local initiative in your community and then we'll get specific with what the heart movement has done. The first key thing, whether your community is a community, um, a geographic community, an interest or an identity community, is to build relationships across that community at all levels, not just with the leaders and the established or existing leaders, but at all levels within the community, um, speaking to the, the loudest and the quietest voices to really understand the place that you're working or community you're working within. Gather what's already existing in the sense of, I might just mute you Tara, because you're like making beeping noises. All right. Oh, I can't do it actually. I can do it. Lovely. Um, so, um, gather all of the existing data and research and stories that are already in the community. Don't think you have to start from fresh. There's usually a lot that's already been done in communities um, that we can draw from. Then use collective processes to assess that information and figure out what does the story tell us so far. Check that with community members, not just practitioners, and say, this is sort of what the evidence is saying. This is what this local report says and this research says. How does that sit with you? Does that feel um, does that feel like it's you know in line with what you understand is going on in the community? Then for issues like family violence and sexual violence, is are these issues a priority in the community? If they're not, why not? Right? So we all know that family and sexual violence are really large scale problems in New Zealand. If they're not an issue, um, testing out why that might be. Who's um, stifling that conversation and why and unpacking some of that and using a start slowly approach is usually the most important in that case. Um, if there are gaps then you can go and complete some local research that can be formal or informal. Informal stuff is um, really easy to do you know online surveys all sorts of ways that we can ask communities what they think about what's going on um, in their in their local area. And then it's about deciding which tools you're gonna to use to develop your initiative. I'm gonna present some today. There are many, many others. My suggestion is don't forget measurement in your development phase. Knowing how you're gonna measure is really key um, right from the beginning. And then use inclusive developmental and iterative approaches um, to build your initiative. We're not gonna have the you know, gold star approach from day one, even in 10 years, you'll still be building towards that. Um, make sure that many voices can be involved and it's not just one section of the community that's there. So the heart movement, um, well, I introduced the heart movement to you all um, in, the, in the first session, but again, um, just introducing um, heart healthy relationships in Tāmaki. Um, I think Tara and uh, Ren are pointing to themselves in the picture, awesome. Um, so this is from the Mana Wahine event um, in 2018. Um, the heart movement is a long-term community mobilization approach. It's evidence-based um, and it's working to both prevent family violence and promote healthy relationships. It um, was developed to respond to community concern about family violence and using a strengths-based and capacity building approach. Um, so it's been running now, um, the first conversations 2008, it was launched in 2012, so it's been running for about eight years now. Um, so before we talk about what we did with Heart, it's important to just know a little bit about the place of Tāmaki, formerly known as Ukutoya, and also used, um, that word is also used to describe the place now. Uh, the mana whenua of the area, Ngāti Pātua o Rāke, Ngāti Paua and Ngātai. Um, so this is the central east part of Auckland on the coast, and um, so if you'd like to read more about the story of the place of Tāmaki, Ukitoya, um, you can access that in a case study that I've written. 
um, and there are a number of really cool resources, including this one, which I'll share with you a little bit later. Um, but just to um, understand the modern day Tamaki a little bit, it was the first planned town centre in Auckland. What this means was, um, it's very unusual to other communities. It has a very high proportion of state housing, 60%, and in some streets up to 90 or 100% of houses are state housing. For this reason, it was really attractive to, um, to people to come to um, Tamaki to live because it had affordable rents um, and it was really close to the CBD. In the 1950s and 60s, Tamaki, Glen Innes, era, you know, the area around Glen Innes really flourished. But in the 80s, it was hit very hard by the economic recession. And a big part of that was because two thirds of local community members were Maori and Pacific blue collar workers who lost their employment in that time of the economic recession. That has had a lasting impact. So, Tamaki is Glen Innes, Point England and Pamua, three communities sitting side by side, and it's a community of about 18,000 people. Um, it has a young population, it's a very vibrant place, and it's a multicultural community. It has larger uh, numbers of Pacific people, Māori and Asian communities than the wider Auckland area, and also a really large part of the community was born overseas. So um, that adds another uh, dynamic and flavour to the Tamaki community. Um, looking at deprivation in 2013, Glen Innes, um, and you know, this is one part of Tamaki, was defined as part of the most deprived 10% of New Zealand. So this is a community that does lack resources. Uh, there has been many um, central and local government initiatives in, um, in Glen Innes, in Point England, and Pamua over the years. Mostly, um, you know, unfortunately, with great you know, levels of resourcing, they've failed. And that's because they haven't worked in with the local community and they haven't addressed the concerns of the local people. So, um, you know, many of those challenges that I talked about from the 1980s have endured. And in fact, they've got worse. So there's a new layer of issues that have come. Things like family and sexual violence, addictions, you name it. You can see it there in that blue box at the bottom of the screen. So there's a layering of challenge that's coming on and the local community got to the point that they said, we need a different approach for addressing these problems. Hence the Tamaki Inclusive Engagement Strategy. This is the first tool that HEARTS used to build um, the community mobilization approach that now runs. So Tamaki Inclusive Engagement Strategy or TIES as it's known, um, was developed, um, started to be formed in 2008 when a group of local people, including Tara Moala, who will talk about this a little bit later on in more detail if you'd like to know more about it, um, developed a principle-based approach to community engagement. They wanted to support decision-making between community, local community members and local organisations and government. The impetus was the Tamaki Regeneration Programme. Um, formerly called Tamaki Transformation Project. It's the largest urban housing redevelopment in New Zealand. So it's a, it was a very big deal, this initiative coming into Tamaki. Uh, the Tamaki Regeneration Company um, became the landlord of all of the housing New Zealand houses in the community. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole webinar to tell the story of this piece of work. But what I'll just briefly um, share is that it, um, has had a number of challenges, it has unsettled the community in many ways and um, there have been a lot of there have been a lot of challenges that have come out of that. We can talk in the question time a little bit more about that. So what the, um, the group of community um, members and leaders wanted to do was to advocate for a co-design and co-delivery approach. They really wanted to be partners in decision making, not have done to but to work with. Um, and the vision for this, um, this strategy was that Tamaki communities actively participate in the decisions that affect their future. Um, you can see at the bottom there the team of um, great people that were involved in that piece of work. What TIES does is it really um, shines a light on the importance of local context, of stories of people in place, of using a strengths-based approach, of having principles and ways of working and what that looks like in reality. Pr 
practical guides for community processes, not just at that high level, but really at the what do we do now in this situation level. Um, it includes tools and a resource book, resource book, um, and a really good training that lots and lots of community members participate in. Ties is alive in the community. It's not a strategy that sits on the shelf. It's a strategy that's used and referred to regularly and formed a really core part of the heart movement. It was one of the first initiatives to take on ties right into its bones and adopt it in. Um, here's an example of the principles um, of ties. So these five principles are used to inform every way of working. You can have a wee look at those, but also I guess from my perspective coming into the community as an outsider, I'm not from Tāmaki, um, this tells me very clearly how I must work and it raises the bar. It, it says we, it's, it's beyond a sort of a, um, a standard approach. This asks more of us and it asks us to develop and grow. And that's a really common trend within the work in communities um, in Tāmaki. So, um, yeah, I'll leave you to have a little look at that. So it's not just what, it's how. The second tool that we've used to help develop the heart movement is the community readiness assessment. So this is a tool that I identified in my master's work trying to figure out how do we build community mobilization initiatives and how do we measure them. Um, community readiness assesses how prepared a community is to address an issue. Um, for the heart movement, we addressed, we assessed both family violence and healthy relationships. And we used the scores to, and the qualitative data, so the quotes and what people said to develop heart. It showed us really clearly where our key areas to start were. Knowledge of efforts. People weren't aware of what was already going on in the community. Knowledge of the issues, the understanding of family violence and healthy relationships was low. And community climate or attitudes. Um, we're not that supportive of change. Um, we have done some research on, um, or we've done three community readiness assessments, and you can see here this, um, the green line is the first assessment in 2011, um, 2014, 2016. You can see the biggest progress on the areas that we were working on, knowledge of efforts, community climate, knowledge of the issue. You can also see some interesting stuff that um, there was some backward movement in 2014. And how we understand that is that actually, you know, we probably thought, um, our key informants probably thought there was more going on in these spaces and that it was more effective than it actually was. Um, so that's the assessments for family violence, obviously once through lightning again, sorry. Um, and then for healthy relationships. So here um, you can see the biggest changes also on um, knowledge of efforts. Um, this resources one was interesting. So in 2011, people reported there were higher levels of resources to support healthy relationship promotion than there were in reality. 2014 and then 2016, it's growing back up. But this was, it's interesting when you have multiple assessments, you can see some of this stuff. Um, so that was one of the key, the second key tool that helped us to develop heart. The third key tool is theory of change. And you'll hear a lot about theory of change. Everyone has a theory of change. Someone said to me, do we all need a theory of change? Isn't it a bit much recently? Theory of change at its most basic is just understanding what you intend to do and why. Um, and then there's more detail about it. But we all have to understand that. Um, it depends how much time and effort you put into it. But at the most basic, we all need to have some understanding of how we think change will happen, especially for things that we um, don't know what the plan is really. You know, we don't know how to stop family violence and sexual violence. We know the things we need to do to get uh, to improve the situation, but we don't have a complete formula we can just apply, right? So um, theory of change, again, um, identified as an important tool to help develop, implement, and measure community mobilization. It's a comprehensive approach to planning for complex initiatives. It articulates the assumptions behind um, thinking, so it makes them visible. We all have really different ways of thinking about problems, um, and this gets all of those assumptions to the surface so they can be discussed. 
Theory of Change links outcomes and interventions to explain how and why change is expected to happen. It creates a shared understanding between those involved through all of the discussion. Um, and in its uh, final version, it includes an outcomes map um, or a pathway of change, which I'll show you here, um, assumptions, interventions, and measures. So here for the heart movement is an example of our first uh, outcomes map or pathway of change. This shows you we have um, two strands of activity, community mobilization in the green here, uh, organizational capacity and collaboration development in the blue. Um, it sort of reads left to right, though we know these processes aren't linear. Uh, we do pretty much have to depict them in that way so that we can kind of understand them. Um, we've built in the community readiness domains into this theory of change because when we started, we had very little evidence to go by to build this initiative. Uh, we now have some more and I'll show you that. So that's a very brief Introduction to Theory of Change is a link in here to the tool that you can use to develop your own theory of change. So, what have we learned so far? Um, we've completed um, research and evaluation on the heart movement. Um, and again, this is another conversation to talk through this part um, in detail. But what we have learned is that we are broadly on the right track. The, the areas that we're working on are showing change um, and it's a very promising, um, the evaluation and research evidence is very promising for HEART, which is a very low cost strategy. So it only costs about an average of $160,000 a year over the eight years that we've been running HEART. That is, um, that is quite low. We do need a little bit more investment, not, not a huge amount, but we also need sustained investment for HEART to be able to plan long term and keep building, not go backwards in between funding coming in and out. Um, community members are absolutely the engine room of community mobilization. Uh, and so building capacity, not only of community members, but practitioners has been the, pretty much our key to success. And that's come through um, a philanthropic grant that's just $10,000 every year and has made training that's responsive to community possible every year. That's made the world of difference. Um, one of the things we've also learned is that organisations need to understand community mobilisation to support it well. Community members kind of just get it straight away. Organisations sometimes take a little bit longer because it's a different way of working. And as I said in the last uh, webinar, it blends that uh, line between practitioner and community member in a way that is unusual and can be really uncomfortable for organisational, um, um, for practitioners and leaders um, because it takes, us, it takes us into a different way of working. A key learning is that scaling up is complex. So though community mobilisation is a large scale strategy that's supposed to engage the majority of community members, it's not easy to do that. We're relying on mainly the voluntary efforts of community members. And yes, there's a certain amount of extra resource you can put in to amplify that, but it's not just about throwing a whole lot of resource. This is about people and relationships more than anything. Um, addressing the wider community context is really essential for community mobilization. So there's a need to partner and work with larger organizations that can affect change beyond the immediate scope of family and sexual violence. Um, a couple of really key examples for the heart movement is um, increasing social cohesion. Uh, that's, that's bigger than, um, what Heart can do alone. Um, there are bigger partners involved, but we need uh, help with that. Likewise, with building organizational collaboration, um, the, you know, the challenges and barriers are much bigger than just what Heart can um, you know, address ourselves with the small um, and mainly voluntary um, effort that the Heart Movement is. So yeah, there's a need to partner up. So for HEART, um, we do our, an iteration of planning every three to four years. So there's been two iterations so far. We're just about to start our next iteration. And that's, um, again, going back to our theory of change and looking at what needs to move, um, what needs to remain, what we've learned. We now have much more evidence because of the research and evaluation that's been completed. 
um, one of those key things is building in the domains of community mobilization that I introduced to you last time um, in a much stronger way now that we know how essential they are to community mobilization and making change. But also, um, you know, we've had evaluation that looks at our impact. We've also had evaluation that looks at our systems and structures and mechanisms. So applying that knowledge now. Um, and Ren is our new um, heart movement lead who's just come into the permanent position. We've been a while without, um, a, without a lead for heart. So now Ren will take up facilitating that process of development with the community. And that's the thing that's quite different about the heart movement. Um, this is not just about practitioners and managers sitting in a room. Um, it's about coming together with the community and planning together. We also need to plan our next uh, phase of research. So we've had those three phases of community readiness assessments. We're due to do another phase of community readiness assessment as well as a second um, use of the Aotearoa Community Mobilisation Questionnaire, which is the tool that I've developed so we can start to measure mobilisation. So we've got a baseline and now it's about tracking change over time. That tool was the one that showed us how important social cohesion was um, and how it was limiting the impact or the potential impact of the heart movement um, because social cohesion is low and that's largely due to the, um, the housing redevelopment project, uh, which we can talk about a little bit more. Um, there are the references that you can have a look at afterwards and go directly to the tools that I've mentioned and also the websites, um, the key websites for Heart Movement, um, Rako Tosoko, the Tamaki or Ties, and also Tamaki Regeneration if you'd like to have a look at that. Um, so I will stop sharing the screen and we can move into questions. Sure, Christy, and thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. I was scribbling down as always some notes and definitely some of um, the things that I took away was the, the iterative and, and community led approach, which often funders don't get. And um, really like, you know, starting a project going, I actually don't know what it's going to look like. It doesn't work well in a funding application um, because funders want to know what it is that you're going to do and have it all nicely planned out and this so there's a bit of work I think we also need to do with funders and philanthropics to really um, get this type of approach because when you're learning together and building together that's when the journey really starts and that transformative approach is what I'm hearing from you and I'd love to hear more about that and um, I really love the the reflection around the boundaries of uh, organizations community professional um, people just getting on and doing stuff um, and how those all marry together. So I took heaps away and um, I know I was listening to um, someone else was texting me, not doing it in the chat and going, this is gold, well done. So thank you um, for being able to consolidate that. Um, Tara, Ram, before we jump into questions, is there anything you want to add before we, we go to our, our attendees and ask them? Only that you did an incredibly good job, Christy, of being able to get that into a um, presentation slide. That was because it's so there's so much, and she's managed to consolidate it. And every single one of those points has a story behind it, and every single one of them has a call it all from a um, community member and a practitioner. So, um, so yeah, well done, Christy. Impressive. Yeah. And from me, I'm like, this is a perfect little nice to do list for me to going forward. <laughs> Thanks very much. That's going to make my job easier. <laughs> Yeah, okay, work. yeah. <laughs> you've got a good like okay these are all the things i need to do next awesome <laughs> great so we've got a first question and please people keep them coming through um so what do you think about using this model for populations which are not geographically co-located because the heart movement was very much based in a certain area so what are your thoughts around that i think it's I, just as easy just as easy. I mean, thinking about um, what the, the one of the silver linings of COVID-19 has been the ability to be able to use um, technology to be able to link and connect people in so many ways. And so I don't see any barrier at all with being able to do things. If you use the tools that we have got, Zoom, change them all to Zoe's and um, get out there and figure it out. I think the most important thing is to figure out our values and our ways of working um, at the very, very beginning. 
I've connected up with um, youth groups, youth collectives, and their zoeys are way different than the ones that are the community practitioners, and they do some really cool things. I've been in, uh, yeah, so quite a few different styles of different ways of using the technology. Um, we um, heard from the Healthy Families down in South Auckland that they did a whole co-design iterative process while in lockdown. And they used Messenger and Facebook because they were both free services. And that was really, really important for all of the people that were involved in that process. And so there's so many opportunities to use the technologies that we can, it doesn't matter. Ge geography is one way of connecting, com of, of being a part of a community. It's definitely not the only. Love it. <laughs> In terms of, you know, we are, we do have some different tools and, and let's figure out how to use them. So yeah, be creative and innovative. Um, this is a slightly more technical question, I suppose, is how might we measure readiness at a national level? And if we are, and I'd add as a supplementary question, you know, if we are measuring readiness at a national level, how would that be useful for an, um, a project or like a movement like the heart in terms of comparing readiness at two different levels? Would it be useful? Yeah, so the, the tools that we've got at the moment are more community specific, but the Fano Resilience um, Initiative, uh, which is a family violence uh, long-term healing initiative that's coming out of the Ministry of Social Development, are using the Community Readiness Assessment in 20 communities, currently that's underway, to look at readiness to address family violence and to build Fano Resilience. Again, those two sides of the coin. So um, that is it doesn't give us the whole country it gives us uh, 20 communities across our country but that helps us to understand um, where things are at nationally it also gives us an ability to look at the differences between communities and where we see you know leadership is really high what are they doing that's so great there and how can we learn from that in other places um, it is community specific context is very important so um, a national level of readiness um, yeah, I'm not sure. What we do probably do well at the national level is um, attitude and behaviour um, population surveys. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure. But yeah, initiatives like Whānau Resilience give us a lot to work with. And though that's for that initiative, um, and it is family violence focused, there's a lot that the community around that initiative can use and those reports will be available to the community um, as well. Yeah, I'd like to just add on a little bit for that one. Um, just that um, whatever, what, however, I'm not, I'm the person on the ground. I love being the one on the ground and, and being in a team of people on the ground in this particular community. And so however the solution is created at the top to be able to figure out how to create that wider understanding of what we are like, Aotearoa wide, um, the on the ground staff always will need to be um, iterative um, for the local community to create and grow themselves. Great, great addition in terms of, I think often in particular funding level, there's this tendency to want to find a solution and just replicate it. And yeah. offline, Christy and I were talking briefly of, um, there's so much nuance in the transition of, you know, who are the people, what is the, what is the community, what do they, what is their understanding that things can't just be taken and planted, they need to be grown, grown locally and from the grassroots. Great addition. Um, so in the HEART initiative, to what degree is sexual violence included? Sexual violence. Yeah. Sexual violence. Well, we do the family planning mm -hmm. Yeah, so we um, have some of our um, partner organisations are um, Family Planning New Zealand and Rape Prevention Education. Um, and both of those are partner organisations who do trainings with us. So the community trainings that um, Christy talked about before, um, we have not every week, but most weeks through the year, we have a community training that is open to community. Um, and over lockdown, we were running them online. Um, so, yeah, just yesterday, actually, we had um, family planning New Zealand in to run introduction to sexuality and relationships. Um, and so through the year, those are kind of um, broken up with all the different topics, but we put out a poll and people from our community decide which ones, you know, they kind of vote on um, the, mo the ones that they would be most likely to, to attend. Um, 
and yeah we basically kind of make the calendar from there so um in terms of training that's what we do in terms of training um mm. And the member organi- uh, partner organisations um, representatives from each of those organisations are invi- invited to be in our in the Heart Collective, um, and also the our Heart Advisory Group. So the collective is um, made up of representatives of um, partner and member organisations, and also our change agents. So um, and they make decisions on um, community uh, a small community action fund that we have. So they definitely have like a lot of, we've got a lot of contact with them and they're in um, kind of planning meetings and um, decisions around um, funding that we put out into the community in small ways. So, um, cool. yeah. Um, and do you find, this is my supplementary question, <laughs> do you find that there's a, a trend over the years of are there certain trainings that the community is more interested in and does that change according to the community readiness? Yeah, definitely, yeah. And we have some really um, popular presenters. <laughs> we work a lot with Peter Thorburn um, who of Mess NZ, if people know him, um, he is amazing we're all big fans (laughs) he's also on our advisory group so we're we're really um privileged to have him on board because he's really busy and travels all over the country doing um different trainings on things um and over over lockdown we kind of locked him in for training once a week over those um over that time and we had um, we were hitting our zoom capacity of 100 people in our trainings each of those weeks i think and um, six of those trainings were capacity. Um, so yeah, and he's got a bunch of trainings. Like I think every year he gives us kind of 25 to choose from. And also if there's anything else, just let me know. Um, and so, yeah, and he's super supportive of the community. And I suppose that's probably why he's so popular because things have come up in our trainings with him. And then he's run kind of side sessions with Fano for example, um, one of them, there were lots of questions around um, raising children with ADHD. And um, so he, he ran the next like week, he just ran a session for some whānau members who are kind of struggling with that in their home. And um, yeah, I think there's also, there's different, sorry, Christy, um, there's different um, things that happen so there's sometimes there's different catalysts Mm. that mean that we um as a community we flow into different ways um in a few years ago we hit um a suicide contagion and so um with our young people and so we actually shifted a lot of the heart work shifted towards supporting and growing um the relationships that our young people have with their parents um with their other adults in their lives and with each other and so um there was quite a lot of shifting in some of the work and that was, it's so important to be iterative in that way. Um, so that's, we definitely um, flow with what happens mm-hmm. and what the community is asking for. So the, the, the poll and the, what do you guys think um, we, what we should be looking at this year is actually incredibly important because it gets us um, really focused on what our community is currently experiencing mm-hmm. each, each year. Yeah. And we put a, um, the training calendar that we put together um, is, has lots of gaps in it towards the end of the year um, for that reason. And then um, things like lockdown happen and then we put six trainings in one week. And so we locked Peter in for those trainings and then every week was actually, they weren't planned out. It was kind of, um, yeah, they changed every week depending. And then, um, so that means we've changed all the trainings that he was locked in for after that. So it's more about um, putting in the dates actually. <laughs> and, then we, and then we work um, from there. Um, yeah. We've also learned that we need to cycle back. Um, you know, though, you know, like in the beginning, we did a lot of introduction to family violence training, dealing with disclosures, and then we sort of moved into other areas, mental health and addictions, primarily were the places people wanted to go. Um, and we realised, you know, we always need to cycle back because there are changes in who's in the community, there's more community members come into the mix. So making sure that we go back and cover those basics um, regularly. Mm. And that um, ties into a couple of questions. One is, um, so you, you talk about, um, Peter, that he's a really big success in the community and you've kind of mentioned a couple of things around how he's responsive. But is there any other kind of 
what you're noticing around what communities respond better to in terms of, and it ties into another question that will come up later around that dance between the professional and the community, like what really puts the community off and what actually is really engaging. If you've got any tips for those who might want to um, run education sessions in a community mobilization type approach. Um, something that I've been kind of talking about a lot, a lot lately and especially over lockdown was kind of the idea that um, um, I think we really work from the place from a place of you like every person is um, the expert in their own life experience kind of thing and so no one um, can come in and, and give you all the answers and tell you how you should do things and that kind of thing so when we go out um, and with our change agents, I think um, we really kind of um, try to make sure they know that that's what we think so that when they go out and, um, you know, in our community spaces, we have um, two rules in our Kōru women's group, which is no judgment and no advice. And that just means that you're not giving people advice on how to do things. And you can talk about your experience and how that situation might be for you, but it's not that we know everything and we're here to change the world and we're here to change your world and fix everything. Mm. So um, there is a term that I can't remember that is around kind of when you're giving, you're trying to help, but you actually could make things worse by, by giving the wrong advice or um, yeah, there's a, yeah, some kind of, there's a term um, <laughs> that I can't remember right now, but I think if if you come from this place of kind of these are my opinions and you know you do have good intentions but you're not giving advice and your um the things that you do give are options and um ref, you know like sharing links and resources or um other um agencies and local local um services then that's you know you empower the change agent to feel like they can help in a way and so it's not always about going to the professionals but um just actually listening and just you know that ju no judgment and no advice thing is actually so so helpful in making change in the academic literature that space kōru is um described as a safe social space so it's not a counseling space it's not a specialist mm -hmm. support space it's a way that we can uh, increase our critical understanding our critical consciousness of an issue um and i think you know, heart through Kōru has really exemplified that brilliantly. It's also a space that both practitioners and community members, like, you know, Tara is a practitioner and community member in Tāmaki, but there are many others as well who come into that space just to be humans together and discuss these problems and current challenges. So, yeah, it's um, definitely moving, you know, we that thing that I said in the last session about, you know, we can't service our way out of this problem. Mm. We have to change our norms. Mm. And that comes from critical reflection on how things are and why they are and how we might make them different for each of ourselves. Mm. Yeah, it's um, that practitioners, if they join the heart movement, they're joining as themselves. They're joining as um, whoever they are and um and if they're not joining as that if they're joining as their organization they pretty soon don't keep coming because you have to have that mm. re that commitment to be able to look inside yourself yes, and you. really understand um who you are as a person to be able to connect and so it, it does it shifts the power balance a little bit and that ties really well into, um, and we've kind of already started answering it. Um, someone asked, you know, can we talk more about that dance of being a community member, a campaign worker in real life? And I know from my experience of working in rural settings, you know, that blend between, um, you know, the worker and the community is a lot smaller because you bump into people at the supermarket and they want to have chats with you and you don't have that, you know, identity that doesn't, you know, you're constantly on and you're constantly that person to go to. So really curious to hear more in particular for those who have potentially that dual identity in a community of you are the professional, but also you're just a community member. It's me. That's pretty much you just described me. So <laughs> you have so lots of conversations in the supermarket. <laughs> Uh, yeah, conversations in the supermarket, at the rugby club, at the um, at the school, 
Um, it, I, it is my life. And as soon as I walk out of my house, I can expect to, um, to have somebody to talk to me about something. And, and a lot of the time it's stuff that would, would, that fits within being a change agent and being a part of the heart movement. So, um, it's definitely a juggle and, um, it's, it's quite interesting because my husband is an Oranga Tamariki social worker. And so we both have quite a different role in life and, um, and we have to make sure we maintain boundaries as well. And so we set, um, after some learning, we set some very strong boundaries in our life. One of them is that we only have a very small number of, of um, people that are in our work life come to our home. So no one, no one of our clients or any Fano that are in the community are to come into our home. The only people, and it's like literally, you know, um, under 10 <laughs> people, mm. um, practitioners that come into this home. Um, and that's because this is a safe space and it can be messy as, and it can be crazy and the kids can be yelling and screaming and I can be yelling and screaming back and that's okay because that's life. And, um, and that's mm. just what it is. And I don't have to have any kind of facade. Um, when I'm out in the community, um, I am Tara, the community worker or the community leader, and I help people in different ways. And so if I'm coming to pick up the kids from school, then I may um, bump across somebody that says, hey, I actually really need help right now. And my kids are very used to jumping into the back of the car and actually driving over to somebody's house and helping them out or um, connecting them up with a food grant or a social social worker or something like that. They're just, my kids are just roll with it. So, um, so yeah, so it is, it is sometimes a little bit difficult and we have to make sure we maintain boundaries. My husband's much, much stronger on those boundaries. He does not talk to anybody within Tamaki about his work. Mm. And of course, for obvious reasons, that's actually incredibly important. Um, whereas I'm on the ground in this community working on it every single day. Mm. It's hard, but it's also um, incredibly rewarding. And um, if you talk to a lot of families in this community about the work that I do, um, they will say that that is what helps them make um, them help them trust me. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. And I think that's... Um... I think there's something quite beautiful about the community approach and, um, you know, it really does build that social cohesiveness in terms of actually I, I see you and I know I can reach out to you and I can trust you. Um, and that, I, I don't know how you replicate that always with services when there's funding, you know, when funding gets in the way and tick boxing and, and people just need help. Um, just for those who might be new to this game of, of or when you know as this is a recorded video when someone watches it and goes oh, I'm going to start this um you've given some tips around self-care maybe all of you can um just top tips around self-care around um around you know being in the community and being and supporting a community to change how do we nourish and sustain ourselves yeah. good one yeah. Yeah. <laughs> my really top, it's always my top it. question of how do we do collective and self-care through any job <laughs> Ren is my sister obviously and she is my self-care guru so she's gonna start <laughs> it's funny because we had a um self-care like workshop with the oh, yeah. a couple <laughs> of years ago <laughs> I think, yeah a couple of years ago and the like person who was facilitating the um, room asked us to get on a like a continuum of kind of like this is where I place myself in terms of my well being and self care, um and then like this is the like low end and the high end and we got in <laughs> and I went straight to the high end and stayed there the whole time and Tara's like yeah, way down the other end <laughs> kind of like we're so yeah really so different. opposite but um I think I am really good at self care and I think. Yeah, there's like a level up, which is, yeah, I kind of thought that was just me being selfish, like, a, or kind of like self interested. <laughs> um, and then when I got into kind of deeper into this work and started talking to people about that, what, what that was, it kind of was like, oh, it's a good thing that I shut off, put my phone down, or or just ignore, like, flick through the notifications that are not meant, um, are work related, or. Um, yeah, I can. I'm. I am really good at switching off and kind of being with friends or family. Um, but we kind of talked a little bit about um, the things that Tara do and that kind of like Tara does and that kind of extrovert and introvert thing. And when like some people want to chill, 
the, her chill space is actually with everyone around mm. and our family is huge and um you know she like that's her that's her chill space and, and for a lot of people that's not but it's not wrong that she that is her chill space and chill space means our 13 nieces and nephews running around playing ring around rosie around her like or or whatever it is so um, and I think like with the heart movement, there's a, we have had a leadership kind of group or program where we were, um, yeah, working on that in a, in a um, personal journey kind of thing. And just being able to acknowledge the things that are good for us and the things that maybe are less helpful. And, um, and even in that space, there were community members and, um, and practitioners and even this morning at the Kuru uh, Women's Space, which I ran from to come here, I asked, there's a new social worker in town, and she and I was talking to her about what the Kuru Space is, and I said to her, because she said, you know, can I bring whānau, the, like, people that I'm working with or clients, to this space? And I said, I kind of think that's your decision, whether if the connection is you, whether or not you can, you want the space to be for you or for for them mm. and if you can't connect with us if you if you would have to connect with us in a different way because they are here then that's your decision if you bring them and she said no I would love to bring them I'm totally real with them we're all on the same boat we're all paddling in the same direction so you know am I allowed and I was like this is yeah this is an open community space that anyone can come from that table and come sit over with us um so yeah. yeah, I think I think it's your own it's yeah. your own decision. Yeah, and I think that's actually really important to acknowledge. I mean, some people, every single person will work differently. And so, for my husband, his way of self care is not with the community. His way of self care is blogging on the couch, playing games with his kids, and really just zoning out of all work. Whereas for me, I can be really real in the Kauri group with a whole lot of people from our community and say, actually, I just took on way too much, and this sucks, and I hate this, and I, you know, like, and just put it all out there and, yeah. and share with the same people that I was helping last week. So, um, and so there's different ways and different levels of people's self care and there's different things. I mean, some people are like, I need to make sure that I have holidays every three months. And so, you know, like how, whatever works for you is the best advice that I've received around self care. And I think you um, just described a, a couple of other really beautiful um, real life and someone commenting, you know, the, that they appreciate the boundaries and real life conversation of you know the quarter group and you know how do you bring in your clients and still build real and that's a really other interesting comp like really beautiful um example of actually what is this all about what are we actually talking about it's not setting up a facade and there's actually being real and coming and bringing all of yourself to the conversation which is what builds trust i suppose is you know yeah. often people that we're trying to support can feel if we're we're holding a part of ourselves, and how do we do that safely um, and and well and keep ourselves well and also get fed by the community in that way because I imagine that also feeds, feeds and nourishes our soul. So I've got, I've got a few questions to get through. So I, I'll go through some of the ones that seem might be a quick answer. Um, Chrissy, at the beginning, you, you mentioned a social enterprise. Um, what, what, oh, was that you, Tara? Sorry. Um, what was the social enterprise that you referred to at the introduction? Yeah, so that's a very quick answer. It's La Kototoko, and at the end of Christie's presentation, there was a link. You can go there. You'll find my email and um, all of the information there. Rendered the website, so that was handy. So, well, she fixed it. Um, so, yeah, so you can get more information from there. Awesome. And then um, when you're running trainings, are there any gaps that you find that you're just not able to find the right trainings that your community wants? Mm -hmm. Not really, but what we do really focus on is getting really high quality trainers in. So we want to get the best quality right to the grassroots, and we've managed to do that fairly consistently over the years. Yeah. So, yeah, we talk to a lot of people and get good advice about different trainers, but yeah, there's usually someone who can meet the need. Yeah. We get a bit of difficulty around like what's the best time, what's the best day, because mm. sometimes people are like, I really wanted to go to that, but I couldn't. Can you run it again? <laughs> so yeah. we juggle those a bit. Sometimes we have night ones. Sometimes we have weekend ones. Right. Um, so there's two slightly longer questions now. Um, it sounds like you're doing a really big job and 
people are wondering if you are available as consultants to support other initiatives. Christy. <laughs> hey, Christy. <laughs> I am. Tara less so these days, now that she has I'm two sure. jobs, Ren, five jobs. <laughs> Yeah, I'm more. I'm. I, I would love if people were interested. Then I would love for Christy to be a lead in it, and for me to come along and total total for that as like a co-facilitator of some kind. Yeah, I love working with Christy, so that would be the best my choice. And just that you know what we're trying to set up is ways to share the tools so that you can just take them and use them. Yes. They're, you know we basically have found tools that are inexpensive to run, they just take a bit of time and we can support you to learn how to use them for yourselves. Um, yeah. Is there a community of practitioners? I mean, I'm just thinking of any tool, no matter how cheap and simple it is, it's the reality of actually putting it into practice and finding those ah, moments of what do I do next and knowing to be able to reach out to fellow community mobilizers to go, have you done this or what would you do then in this situation? Because that's what build your competence is. You know, you do your, your first bit of training, but it's when you're in learning in real life that that's when you actually build your competence. So mm -hmm. has, is, has anyone ever started a community of practice amongst community mobilizers across Aotearoa? Does that exist? Just informally, I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think we all just help each other. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's definitely like people that, that I go to that I call my gurus. Um, yeah, that are the kind of like relationships that I have with people. And sometimes we end up doing a multiple chat with several people in it. That's just sharing, unpacking things. I don't know if there's an official one that I know of. I don't think so. We've been too small at this point. <laughs> your next part is your next job, Miriam. <laughs> But I agree, sometimes it is that informal, who are my guru, my personal gurus and then who are the broader people that I can reach out to and, and gain support from. So, yeah. Um, the last uh, question, unless there's any others that people want to pop through and we're quite open to them, um, is a bit more technical, but around the community readiness approach. So um, they, they say, you know, I'm guessing in any community, there's some sub communities within it. And these may differ in their readiness for change. Was this the case that you encountered? And if it was, how did you influence, how did it influence your approach? We worked with the willing. Yeah. And also our <laughs> community readiness, like we talk about, you know, communities within the community of Tamaki. Um, our community readiness assessments have been um, across the community, not specifically into one community group. So we, we know that there are differing levels of readiness from, you know, our own interactions, but we haven't documented that. We haven't gone down to that level of detail. But that, would be, um, that would be a really great thing to be able to do. Yeah. Yeah. But also, as Tara says, you know, we do work with those who are ready um, often. Yeah, that's our first, our first place. Yeah. And we got some, we got some, and I've been involved in the heart movement from the very beginning. And um, when we got over the time, we have had some pushback at different things and kind of saying we should be going in this direction, we should be going in that way. Um, and so what we've done, we've said when, whenever anybody's come to us and said that sort of thing, we've opened our door wider. So we've said, come in, let's have a quarter door about that. Let's think about what that means and what that looks like. And sometimes it did shift and iterate some of our stuff. And sometimes it meant that it was going to carry on later on or it was going to be a sub thing. I think the most, um, the most important thing for us is making sure our door was always open and also really encouraging other people to try other ways as well. It doesn't matter if there's more than two or three different things that are working on family violence. Our, our, our need is so high that we're just like, Keep, let's all do it. <laughs> So, yeah, so there may have been other things that have happened along the side at different times. We've definitely been the, the longest and strongest and biggest um, in Tamaki. Um, but that doesn't mean the others weren't valuable as well. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, we do have this thing, unfortunately, where people kind of, when they don't know much about an initiative, um, are quite quick to simplify it down to, a, oh, they just do that or like for heart, they just do healthy relationships. Mm. And, you know, we, we do quite a lot more than that. And there are, you know, when people are kind of negative about it, usually we try and invite them in because often they just don't know about all of the different things we do. And 
um, we're wanting people to get involved, bring that critique and help us to grow it and become more comprehensive. So yeah, it's definitely about participation big time. Mm. Yeah, and that's, I've been thinking a lot in terms of social movements and the development of social movements, how we prevent backlash in terms and that sounds like a really interesting strategy of you know welcoming people in and having those conversations those quarter around the the tricky gnarly bits um because often that the backlash is is created from the gap and miscommunication feeling that someone else is being othered um that's that's when those emotional needs pop up um so yeah interesting to see it would be interesting to research how community mobilization could prevent backlash if anyone wants to research that. <laughs> Another one. Another one for you, Miriam. <laughs> <laughs> want to join me, Tara. <laughs> um, so if there's no other questions from the group, um, please do put them through. I have also put the evaluation form in the chat if anyone would like to fill it out now. Um, but it will be sent out with the recording of this webinar, which will go out first thing tomorrow morning and um, together with the slides. And I've also put in the chat um, the, the website that Tara was mentioning. But if there's no further questions, firstly, I'd like to thank all three of you. This has been a really lovely presentation and um, great, great quarter. And I've, I, my excitement about community mobilization keeps increasing. Um, and one of the things I was listening to before, the critical pedagogist in me, um, the, the focus on the how instead of the what is really um, what drives me a lot in my work is if we're going to get somewhere, the how has to be as strong as the, the why and the how have to be as strong as the what. So um, you really enjoyed that and love hearing actually your, your actual experience in the community of developing and driving change. So thank you so much for coming, Tara and Ren. Um, any last thoughts and comments from you three before we close with a karakia? Only thank you very much for the opportunity. It was awesome. Lovely to see all the comments on the site as well. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. Mm -hmm. um, really appreciate it. And um, also, go hard. It's, um, it is, it's, it's great work. So go well. So we'll close on the go hard. It's great work. I think that's a great way to close. Um, and, I, and I think it's a good, a good mantra for prevention is go hard or go home, you know. <laughs> uh, that could be you know our prevention mantra from now on love it but um yeah we'll, we'll close here and thank you so much for today it's been a great session so uni here uni here uni here kiti uru tapunui kia wātia kia māma te nāko te tīnana te wairoi te aratangata ko i a rā e rongo whakairia a kirikirunga kia tīna tīna kia tai Kia ora, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Kia kite anō, everyone. Hopefully, we'll see you at the next prevention uh, webinar.